I said, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to be a stand-up comedian. And I knew I had found what it was I wanted to do in life. Now, I wasn't going to let anybody step on that dream. I'm lucky enough that I, I do get paid sometimes to do stand-up. It's not enough for me to live off of it, but I like that I get paid. It's, it makes me feel like I'm a working comedian. There's so many comedians out there that make a great living at it. If I told you right now, you know, you can make a quarter of a million, a half a million dollars a year being a sort of unknown guy, not a superstar. Would you be happy with that? Absolutely. The guys with the cufflinks, I'll tell you, my girlfriend's so fat, she running around the house. I wanted to make it something else and something more important. It is a business. It's not, it's an art form, but it's an art form that you're selling and what you're selling is yourself. And you can make a lot of money. You really can make a lot of money. I'm not gonna lie, I have made a lot of money. But you can lose a lot of money too. If it ain't working for you, you can lose. In the 1950s, there weren't clubs really for stand-up comedians. There were music clubs, there were nightclubs where it was mainly singers and musicians, and occasionally a stand-up comedian could get on. The comedians who really started to make it in the 1950s were doing some of the beat clubs, like in San Francisco, the Hungry Eye, in New York, the kind of underground clubs, the, uh, the Blue Angel and the Bonsoir, that were kind of hip clubs. But these were not clubs geared to comedians. But it wasn't until the 1960s that there really came along comedy clubs that were strictly geared towards stand-up comedians. It was in 1963 that Bud Friedman opened a club called The Improvisation in Times Square in Manhattan. It was the only club of its kind, as far as I knew, and was a template for all that was to follow. Because what I was going to do was open a coffee house with food for for Broadway performers to get up and sing. This was a place to ply your trade, a place where you could get up and try out things. There was no such thing as a comedy club. So there was nothing like it in the world. And when I became the comedy club a year and a half later, certainly there was nothing like it. And suddenly they had a place where they could go that was a club primarily geared toward comedians. And people got used to coming in there to see the latest comedians, the newest, youngest, and most interesting comedians at the time. I quickly realized I, I had a better ear for comedy than I did for singers. It was in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, that a guy named Robert Klein started coming in. Klein was the big star. And he was also a comedian who had a style that really caught on among the other younger comedians. I, I see Robert Klein as the top of the comedy tree and all the others coming from, uh, from the branches of, of, of Robert Klein's innovative approach to comedy. The guys with the cufflinks, and I'll tell you, my girlfriend's so fat, she running around the house, they made me laugh and all, but I wanted, I, I was arrogant enough and in college educated and graduate school, I wanted to make it something else and something more important. No talking. I had just gotten uh, into my first Broadway show, Apple Tree, and I heard about the improv, where you could go and stand up, and I, I felt I had been seasoned at Second City uh, after having been 14 months there. And you couldn't just walk up and get on, you know. I mean, if he were desperate at 1.30 in the morning and he didn't have people, he'd, but he had a hierarchy, you know. It was a wonderful uh, testing ground because the audience was discriminating. They were uh, somehow people that liked theater. They liked show business. They weren't your ordinary customer. I had no business acumen. I had worked as a waiter. I had never really cooked. And uh, I certainly didn't know anything about the liquor business. And I avoided the liquor business in the beginning uh, by making it a coffee house with food. I struggled along for 10 years, hand to mouth, mouth to hand, because I didn't know anything about the business. So that's where it was born, where the comics didn't get paid. Because if I'm not going to get paid, they're not going to get paid. 
the improv really caught on as the place to see comedy. Now it was a place where comedians could go, they didn't get paid anything. This was a place, just a showcase club, where they were seen by agents and managers and hopefully would get work out of it, but they weren't paid anything. Still, it was the place to go, and Bud Friedman made a huge industry out of that stand-up comedy from that club. Except for a handful of comics. Comics were the opening act. That was it. And I like to feel that I brought comedians into the forefront and helped make them stars. Clubs were the main place where comedians got work in the 50s, but the place where they really got their national exposure was on TV, particularly shows like The Ed Sullivan Show. It was the biggest, and if you did The Sullivan Show, you were in. I mean, a spot on Sullivan was the absolute pinnacle for a comedian. Uh, unless they came to a nightclub, and how many people came to a nightclub? 250 to 500 at the most, you know? But here now you're getting, to, you're getting to a million, you're getting to two million, you're getting on the Sullivan Show, you're getting six million. That was the way they became known, and that just spurred their, uh, their club work. That obviously gave a big boost to their recognizability and got them uh, work in the clubs. Let's see, where was the first place I worked? A place in Chicago that was owned by the boys called the Cuban Village. At that time, every town had one or two, three little, little nightclubs. And it's the same way they had the comedy, these comedy stores, you know? They had nightclubs. The thing that, that really started my power up was Las Vegas, and where I was getting $100,000 a week, because I brought in the biggest gamblers that were around. I brought in the New York gamblers, I brought in the, the, uh, the Japanese gamblers, the South American gamblers. I brought all those people in. I did. It was all, all very warm, uh, very giving when the hoodlums owned it. Then the corporations came in and that individual performer didn't mean that much to them. The Howard Hughes Corporation who signed me to a big contract, it was, it was no joy working for them, you know. I'd rather work for a guy that had the gun over here. In the post-war years, I think the Catskills were the primary place where comedians got their start and a certain network of, of nightclubs. The most magical time I thought in my career, it was the Concord Hotel was the jewel of the Catskill Mountains. And every comic's dream was to be, quote, a Saturday night comic at the Concord. Because if you were a Saturday night comic, that meant you were a star. You had made it in the mountains. The biggest stars worked there. And it's a, it was a difficult place to work because you didn't pay for the show. The show came with the chicken. It was the chicken, roast beef, and the show. So it was, you had to really get these people. You had to get them quick. They weren't going to wait around for you to be charming. No, I must tell you, this is the truth. My wife, God bless her. This is my 47th year of being a professional stand-up comedian. And I made my living telling jokes. I did jokes. And I take great pride in that. I take great pride in, in I made a good living and the most difficult career there possibly could be. Come on, you're a sports fan. How many Jewish men do you know that could dunk the ball? I'm glad I've been able to go all over the world, take care of my family. And it's an amazing thing that I could do it just telling jokes. I didn't write series, I didn't do movies. Just walk out on that stage in one. It's just me, a microphone, and an audience. Then in the 70s, the other major platform for comedians, of course, was The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I did The Tonight Show originally on January 19th, 1968. Killed him on the stand-up and, and thus, you know, began a career. When you killed him on The Tonight Show, people talked about your spot. You could really get America chatting if you were on that show. He was um, extremely generous with his laughter, and his support when you worked hard to uh, do his show and prepare properly. Johnny was such a fan of comedians. He was a comedian himself. He gave such a, a, a great forum and a great audience for comedians. Johnny himself was a great audience. When I did my first appearance on The Tonight Show, the next day CBS signed me to, to a development deal. A guy had seen me on the show. That show was powerful. When I came out here, you know, I was broke, I was down and out, I had no money, I was hitchhiking up and down Sunset Boulevard every day, begging to work for free at the comedy store. My wife left me three times, she hated this idea of show business. Every time I'd, I'd get back together with her and the kids, it was, get a job in a factory, please get a decent job, quit this crazy dream of yours. But I knew that's what I wanted to do and I wasn't going to let anybody get in my way. About eight months later, The Tonight Show saw me. 
And I wasn't making any money in those days. Tonight Show saw me and I got on my first appearance on The Tonight Show. The audience, I got 11 applause. Uh, I went back, when I finished, I went back through the curtain. Johnny Carson called me back out for another bow and I have never stopped working since. If you did Johnny Carson, you got the New York crowd. If you did Sullivan, you got the country. Sullivan was the real mass audience, whereas Johnny Carson was a little bit more of the in crowd. But as the years went on, pretty soon Sullivan left, and Carson was the only spot, the only major spot for comedians. On television, there were plenty of variety shows that had comedians, but by far the most important was The Tonight Show. When you did The Tonight Show, you didn't get paid much money, but what happened was you got national exposure and suddenly your value in clubs and in tours increased many times. The comedy club explosion started with the improv, Bud Friedman's improv, in the 1960s. When that became so big, it was in the early 70s that a second club in New York, Catch a Rising Star, opened up. And that became even hotter than the improv. Uh, it was 1972, I opened up Catch a Rising Star on the Upper East Side. And I really just thought that there was a need for some entertainment in that area because all the entertainment was down in the village or Bud over on the west side uh, with the improv. So I came up with an idea of Catch a Rising Star. A catch became red hot, white hot. Everybody was hanging out at Catch. Not long after that, in the late 70s, a third club called the Comic Strip opened in New York. The comic strip is what's called the showcase club, where you might see 10 comics in one night. I got a chance to interview all these great comics, and I asked them, what was it about the comic strip in particular that made that club so special? What most of them said about Richie Tinkin was that he was nurturing, that they felt safe there. He gave them food. Richie gave them t-shirts. He gave them hamburgers. He said sometimes that could have been the only food they had all day. But to me it was a hamburger. I didn't realize these guys were starving. A lot of them didn't eat all day. And they would come in and have their hamburger and they'd go up. And it was like a family kind of a thing. We had a lot of fun. In L.A. in the meantime, Bud Friedman opened a branch of the Improv and uh, the Comedy Store was opened. So there were two or three big clubs in New York, two or three big clubs in Los Angeles. That created a spawning ground for many more stand-up comedians because they could practice their craft every night in these clubs. And so the, the number of stand-up comedians just multiplied. The club scene started to boom in the 70s, but it was still mainly a New York, Los Angeles phenomenon. In the 80s was when, taking their lead from the New York and LA clubs, comedy clubs started to spring up in virtually every city, sometimes two, three, and four in each city. Now suddenly you had a circuit of comedy clubs and a comedian could actually make a good living going out on the road and doing tours of these comedy clubs. Suddenly stand-up comedians who were working for free at the clubs in New York and LA, the showcase clubs, now they had a real source of income. They could travel around the country and make pretty good money on the road. When I first came up, that was 1984, and it was kind of in the middle of the comedy boom. It was right at the beginning of the comedy boom when comedy was like rock and roll in New York City, and there was lines around the block at all the clubs, and it was a really exciting time. They would get exposure on TV by going on a lot of these cable TVs, like Live from the Improv, and a, a bunch of other shows that really sort of spun off of the stand-up comedy explosion. We were just all focused on the work. All we did was talk about comedy. At the end of the night, two, three in the morning, and we all did like, I used to do 10, 15 shows a week, just to stage time, stage time, just to get good. At the end of the night, we would all hang out, we would just talk about our material and bits that we were doing and the work, and we were just all focused on being great stand-up comics, not getting a sitcom or, uh, you know, making a lot of money. So they were getting national exposure, on TV, which raised their value as a touring comedian. They could make good money on the road. So in the 80s, it was you know, like the heyday for a stand-up comedian. You could actually make a living. And there were hundreds of them, 
making a living as a stand-up comedian. I did every hell gig imaginable, standing up on a bar in Jersey. Every horrible situation I did, and it made me stronger. The show business thing, I mean, it is a business. You really have to see it as such. And there was a, a lot of people that I came up with who were brilliantly funny, who just didn't really get that business, e either get the business side or have the tenacity, and they're gone now. But then, of course, there came a point when it got overexposed. There were too many of these shows on TV, too many stand-up comedians, too many mediocre ones were getting lots of TV exposure, and I think people just suddenly overdosed on them. With the improv as a template and television spreading the word, television was an important element in creating the comedy industry, obviously. Um, a bunch of comedy clubs spread out all over the place. And then my understanding is there was a kind of retrenchment, which is capitalism and Darwinism <laughs> in action. There was a flood of comics, there was a lot of jobs, but I think what happened in those days was that um, the level of professionalism dropped as everybody thought um, they could just get on stage and talk about funny stuff. <laughs> it was this comedy inflation thing where you'd had people that didn't even belong on stage on stage. And that, I think, hurt a lot. Live performance that wasn't up to snuff. What happened was a, a simple question of uh, supply and demand. Uh, there's capitalism involved and uh, free enterprise. And also, I would say, a dilution of talent. Uh, I think there were a lot of people that were possibly good living room or workplace comedians that were suddenly on a stage. People didn't feel they should pay money for it. But my understanding was it were just too many clubs. It couldn't be, they couldn't be supported. And I don't think it's only the talent, but I, just too many of them. The only thing I know is stand-up comedy. Let's say your CPA invites you to a party of VIPs and you're supposed to RSVP, ASAP, and BYOB. That's the only thing I've ever done my whole life was be an entertainer and a successful one at that considering I made a living at it. This vest cost like one joke, this house cost <laughs> thousands of jokes. So I wrote a book called Stand Up Comedy the Book. Nobody wanted this book. I sent it out to 59 agents um, and this was in the late 80s and people said nobody wants to know how to become a stand up comic. Nobody. And then Oprah Winfrey, she had me on her show. She held up my book and she said, Judy Carter can show you how to make your sense of humor pay off. Next thing I know, I'm at my gynecologist's office and, and he's saying, yeah, your pap smear is really good and come see me, I'm at Yuck Yucks. And I'm going, oh, what have I done? Everybody in the world became a stand-up comic. So the crash came in the late 80s, early 90s. And suddenly all these comedy clubs and these, this circuit of, of clubs that had grown up around the country, they started to fail. See, people think it's because it was too much on TV and it was too much saturation. No, it wasn't. It was the fact that there was just too many people trying to become comics. And when you have that many Trump people trying to become comics and you have people running clubs that don't know what they're doing, they end up taking these bad comics and putting them on stage. And people that come to a comedy club for the first time go, I'm never going back. It was a horrible show. When I was seven, I asked my grandfather for a bike, and he goes, right before I die, I'm going to write a big check, and I'm going to put it in the coffin with me. Nobody gets nothing! That's why you have to nurture the comics, find out who the ones that really want this, that wake up every day and say, I want to be a comic the rest of my life. I want to make this a career, not a hobby. Probably somewhere around the late 80s, early 90s, rooms started to close, which I don't think was a bad thing. I think there was too much comedy and not enough good comedians. We comics who had worked our way up, we really cut our teeth on the road. We, we would take a joke and work it and work it and get it so it's haiku poetry. And then all of a sudden you had everybody just like, you know, what's up with my mother-in-law and what's up with Viagra? What's up with that? And I, what happened with it all of a sudden being on television at the same time and lower quality uh, of co comedians in the clubs, it started to die. It just started to die. And then all of a sudden, um, the money for comics started to die as well. In the late 80s, early 90s, the club scene started to fade. And 
a lot of these clubs folded and even the vanguard clubs, Catch a Rising Star in New York closed in the early 90s. There were just too many comedians, too many clubs, and people finally overdosed on them. So then there was the crash. I think at the time after the bust, we sort of gave up on our dream of being comedy superstars. Um, in the 80s, we all felt like we were sort of standing in line waiting for our sitcom, and it was just going to happen. It was right. just, it's silly. It was Looking very, back yeah. on it, it was a ridiculous thing that we were thinking. Everybody thought this was a linear process where right. you go on stage, you do up mics, you get good, you headline, and the boom. Uh, then the phone rings, and you have a sitcom. After the crash in the 90s, then kind of slowly after uh, 2000, uh, in the last few years, the club scene has kind of uh, picked back up again. And in New York City, for example, you've got more comedy clubs now than you had even in the peak years of the 70s and 80s. Uh, my name is Chris Mazzilli. I've been in the business about uh, 21 years. Uh, started as a comedian and actor first, and then opened Gotham in May of 1996. And, and it's really a full-time, 24-7 job. Uh, I feel very fortunate to have this place. I love what I do. I love the business. I love the talent. My name is Benji Suswine. I am the booker here at Stand Up New York. This is kind of where they work out material. This isn't where they're looking to make their money. So we don't pay them uh, a lot because at the end of the day, we'll never have more than 120 people at a show. My name is J.R. Ravitz. I've been working at the Comics Club Live for 17 years. The club's motto has always been for 35 years, uh, discovering the stars of tomorrow tonight. Can you make a living? Yes, you can. Can you, can you feature and travel around the country as a middle act? Yeah, you might make a couple hundred a week or this and that. Can you headline at a thousand a week? Well, yeah. If you're into, if you're a single guy or girl and with a, with, a, with a car and wants to go around town to town and you party and have a good time, yeah, you can live off that. The big payday, can anybody get to that level? Some people will, and we'll see who they will be, you know, and hopefully uh, they'll walk through here. You know, I want people who walk through that door to be greeted the right way, to love their seats, to love the show, the service. Uh, and I want the same thing for the comedians. I want them to feel like, hey, I'm coming to a special place where I feel safe, I can do what I want to do, and uh, you know, I like coming to this room. Comedians typically make most of their money at private events or corporate events or colleges. A room like this in most of the typical comedy, what's known as a comedy club here in New York City, uh, we generally pay the same. It's not very well. It's mostly just to uh, cover your getting there getting back, we try to treat them nice, we let them drink for free. But this is, in, in terms of uh, business, this is mostly where they're doing their work. They like, a lot, I hear a lot of comedians describe it as a gym, where you try out your new material. I once dated a suicidal girl. My friend's like, why? Because I'm not looking for a long-term relationship. <laughs> My name's Gabe Waldman. I started as an open mic comic. I kind of am still an open mic comic. <laughs> First time I ever performed comedy, I did a comedy show here when I was 17. Longest three minutes of my life. Uh, I bought the comedy club with my business partner four years ago. And we have shows every night of the week. Yes, it looks like a fun business. I'm gonna hang at the bar with my friends. It's a big risk, it's a big risk. There's bills. There's a lot of bills to pay, you, you know? People say, oh, it's only drinks I buy. There's a lot of bills. There's a lot of comedy clubs. There's 10, 11 comedy clubs. You have to know the funds that you have to go in. You have to say, I'm willing to take these losses, the risks I take yet. And Stand Up New York's been surviving, so sold out crowds, packed shows, become a hot club, and we hope to be around for a long time. 30, 30 seconds, live. We've done other TV series out of here, but they were live to tape, you know, so the show gets shot, it gets edited, you know, it's, it's a different feel. This show was actually live. Live, live. So tonight, when we film the show at 10 o'clock at night, it airs 10 o'clock. People can see comedy exactly how it's going on in the club at that particular time. You know, with the waitresses and waiters going back and forth, with the beer bottles falling, and you know, you're seeing things just the way it, it is. If somebody has seen the show on TV and they've seen the interior of the club and they've seen funny comedians on the stage, they're going to say, oh, I know that place, let's go there. That's really it. That's how it benefits, you know? And if the show is rerun, which this show usually runs six or seven times a week, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people that are seeing the show and you're putting this club's name in the back of their mind. So it, it can't but help business. I think what's different today about the business of comedy is there's so many more outlets and avenues for comedians. Back in the 70s and 80s, it was a little more 
uh, kind of rigid. There was the club scene, there was the TV, there was guest shots on TV, there was maybe a sitcom if you got really good. Today there's so much going on and these comedians are still not making very much money from the clubs but they're driving their their popularity in other ways with social media, Twitter, Facebook. Comedians are very active on Twitter, in fact more active than I would say any other type of performers. Not only is it a way for them to try out their material, a quick one-liner, see how many retweets or how many favorites you get, but it's a way for them to interact with their fans, for them to tell their fans where they're next performing, with us to interact with comedians and their fans. The internet really changed the game, and with YouTube in particular, uh, and Twitter and things like that, it really change the game because you don't have to have very much money in order to have an audience of potential millions. It's good and bad. It's, uh, it's harder to get noticed because there is so much content out there. Um, and also it can, be, it can be kind of paralyzing because you really have no excuse to make that short film or make that web series. And if you put it out there and it doesn't get views and it doesn't, uh, people don't respond to it, well maybe it wasn't very good. Maybe that great idea you had wasn't so great after all. I think ultimately though it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, the, the internet has really changed the path for a lot of people getting discovered. YouTube, making videos on YouTube, suddenly comedians from Nowheresville can make a name for themselves with a good video on YouTube. Uh, I'm Danny Jollis. I have a group called Chess Club Comedy, uh, which is an online sketch comedy group. Hello, can I please get the bacon sliders? Because of our production costs, we lose more money than we make. And so Chess Club, uh, yeah, it's given us a bunch of great opportunities. And so the things we get off of it, the representation, the shows, even the credits, that's all led to bigger opportunities. And YouTube has allowed people who would, might not have ever heard of me to all of a sudden find out who I am and then have me come to their college or whatever. And so that's how, at least financially, it's been huge for me. So the avenues for stand-up comedian have expanded and changed immensely here in the new uh, millennium. And it's a much more democratic world now, I think. You don't have to depend on a Bud Friedman or a Rick Newman to Catch a Rising Star to pick you and say you can go on at 10 o'clock in our club. Now, if you do a good video on YouTube or come up with a clever gimmick on social media or on the web, you can become a star. Chess Club Comedy is a partner of the Above Average Network, which is Broadway Video's branch of digital. And so they are they're the company that has SNL and 30 Rock. And so what we do with them is, is they pay us based on our revenue. The amount of money we make off our YouTube channel is so small. Uh, it's really, between three of us, not even worth it. It's splitting up, we just put it right back into production. But being put on MTVU and all that stuff, that pays, that makes money. And then even more so, me being able to do in stand-up. We name kids too quick. My parents messed up. We name kids way too fast in this country. It's like the instant you have a baby, you name it. It's too fast. <laughs> Tom, it's like, give it a second. Now all of a sudden I'm making a decent amount of money and I'm able to all of a sudden not have to worry about a job just because of that and that's all because of that. The comedy world has changed. I think stand-up was the main driving force of comedy in the 70s and the 80s. But now I'd say the, sh the emphasis has shifted a little more to the kind of uh, improvisational group sort of comedy. I, I miss you. I haven't seen you in months. Okay? Come here. Come here, okay? Uh... The Upright Citizens Brigade in New York, the sketch comedy has become a little more important and the individual stand-up comedian has a little, I think, tougher go of it these days. I think that the improv style comedian, the group comedy, these are the people who go to Saturday Night Live, these are the people who go into sitcoms, these are the people sometimes who get movie work. So I think that now has become a little more important avenue for uh, comedians starting out. The Upright Citizens Brigade is very uh, career oriented and very competitive. We want people to be thinking about developing their voice in order to uh, be someone who could be hired to act or write or direct in TV or film, uh, to make a career in comedy. But also being realistic, we have thousands and thousands of students every year and only a very small percentage will ever make a career in comedy. That's just the reality of the comedy business. So uh, sometimes people will call it like a launch pad or a farm system or things like that. 
and to a degree that's true, but we also want to be realistic. For most of us, myself included, we won't be able to make a career only doing comedy. That's only a, a few very lucky people get to do that. My name is Ali Faranakian and I work at the People's Improv Theater. We're a theater of improvisation, sketch comedy, solo performance in New York City, and we've been around uh, over 10 years. I, mean, I would say like a show like Saturday Night Live or any show that does, you know, comedy is looking for someone who does great characters or great impersonations or they themselves are a great character and do one single character but also can do it under the rarefied conditions in a cool, calm, collected way where they're, uh, they do well under pressure and they're just funny. Take an improv class and be on TV. Does it happen? Yeah. It's not impossible but that's not usually the way it happens. Take that energy, that mass amount of energy you guys just expended on me, multiply it by 10 for the next comics coming up. How's that sound? Yeah! The Comedy Store is a stand-up comedy club that's been here since 1972, owned by Mitzi Shore. Mitzi Shore and Sammy Shore initially opened it together, but Mitzi took it over in 1974 and has created something which will never be duplicated, which is an environment that grows and develops comics. Mitzi Shore, the only comedy store, put on her epitaph someday when she's gone. Stand-up comedy is an art form. I'm talking to a guy I've seen in 15 years, okay, since we was in college together. <laughs> My name's Tommy. Uh, I'm the talent coordinator. I'm the doorman. I'm the phone guy. I oversee it emotionally. I'm the person that is overseeing this place artistically to make sure that it is what it's supposed to be, which is the best comedy club in the country. Putting out talent, not just letting people come and retire here. I know guys who are not very talented who get sets everywhere because they're good salesmen. All comedians are salesmen, probably. You know? No. Art and craft at the store art and craft. If you're a big star, come on in. If you don't got it going on, don't bother me. Sorry, that's the way that it is. Other than that though, you're welcome to come in and show us what you got going on. And then we'll see. Tonight I'll have a lot of fun. We're exploiting my birthday tonight, so you know, the, the, it's gonna be an easy crowd. I think there might have been a little mistake. Is this not the Levine Bar Mitzvah? Uh, uh, that's what my agent had me booked for. I'm Howie Walfish. I've been working at this particular place for years. I play the detective in these murder mystery dinner shows. And this is a banquet room. And that's where they look for to, to be able to do their shows. And whenever I see a room, I look, you know, can I do comedy there? Will it work? Can I work something out with the venue? I want to do where the locals get the word that, oh, there's some real talent at that room, and we'll happily pay the cover or the minimum purchase to buy food and drink, and they don't have to drive to Hollywood. We're in Westwood right now. They don't have to drive to the Improv in Hollywood, to the Laugh Factory, to the Comedy Store, on a Friday or Saturday night, worry about the DUI. An empty banquet room is not a good thing, especially on a weekend night. So I pitched it and I offered it, but I make no guarantees. I can't guarantee any number of bodies. So we came to an agreement that they need at least 14 bodies in here, spending a minimum of $18 a head, and they'll give me what I negotiated, 250 bucks. And I said, you know, if we wind up with 60 or 70 bodies, uh, don't be afraid to give me 350 or four. You know, let's be fair. I'll get 250, I split it with my partner. I'm gonna make 125 bucks tonight. I get the, it's my stage, it's my show. I got to pick the talent. Oh, that's good. Wallace. That's good. How you doing tonight? Fort Walling is just all on you. The walls come down, they come down on you. And so owning the show and, and Fort Walling, uh, that means I do all of the marketing, I do all of the advertising, everything business-wise associated with the show. I do it. I do the hiring of the people, I do the writing during the day, I make the TV ads. Whatever it is to do to make this show work, I do it. Rent, you gotta pay f uh, sound, <laughs> Some things people don't even think about. I gotta go up tomorrow, I go visit all of the concierges at the hotels, I meet them, hey, I'm George Wallace, I'm a part of your community, here's some uh, vouchers, come down and see the show. Full walling is you own everything and, and you can make a lot of money, you really can make a lot of money. I'm not gonna lie, I have made a lot of money. 
But you can lose a lot of money too. If it ain't working for you, you can lose. Advertising is what costs all the money. I don't depend on the comedy club to do my advertising and exposure. I make sure when I go into a market that people know I'm coming. I will go and spend some advertising money of my own to the radio station, billboards, like I'm going to Birmingham. They do a little advertising, but I can't depend on them to do it right. And some of these comedy clubs, you know, you can make as much money in a comedy club now as you can anywhere else. They see three, five hundred, you take the door. You can walk out of there and just do it with, with a lot of money. So I've always been the guy that's pay me for what I do, and I'm not afraid to work. And so and that's what has kept me here in Las Vegas this many years working. That's the business of making the comedy business work here in this Flamingo Room with 750 seats out there. We will always be in business. The economy goes down, the economy goes up. Death, I don't care what, people need to laugh. The, the business of comedy will never, ever die. When everything else goes down, the economy goes down, life goes down, laughter goes up. The business of comedy is good. How are you? Well, I'm Chris Monty. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from New York. I, I grew up in Long Island. I've been doing stand-up now for approximately 15 and a half years. You know, you don't always just get into a comedy club and you're going to be on stage. They're going to give you spots. You have to earn your keep. You have to hang out, go to the open mics, bring people. Every comic knows about bringer shows. You start out, hey, you go on, you got to bring five people. You got to bring eight people. I did all of those shows. I did whatever it took until I exhausted, you know, the eight or ten people I knew that would always come. And I said, I can't ask these people anymore. So then I started putting together my own shows. You know, maybe as a bar that has a back room that we can do a Tuesday night show, produce my own show so I can get on stage. And I started becoming a regular in the clubs. And I went from, you know, just a Thursday night guy doing a spot to a guy that was getting paid to host on the weekends, to a guy that was getting paid to feature on the weekends. But there were financial hardships that came along with that. There was living paycheck to paycheck, living week to week. I couldn't, you know, go out and buy new clothes. I couldn't, you know, have health insurance. I couldn't go out with my friends who had regular jobs. They were like, hey, we're going to dinner on Sunday for so-and-so's birthday. I, I, you know, I can't do that because I'm, I'm going to rather do a set for no money and you know, go back home than go out and enjoy. I don't have 100 bucks or 50 bucks to spend on a meal. So once I took that leap, I never looked back. I said, I'm never going back to a day job. This is what I'm going to do. And then I, now, I, of course, I live on my own. I have a, a great place where I live. I do this for a living. I'm doing all this hard work because it's going to grow and build into a career that I can be, you know, be happy and proud of and you know, live off of. <laughs> I'm Jeffrey Gurian. I'm uh, a comedy writer and a comedian. I didn't perform until recent years. I spent so many years writing for people. And then so many people told me that I should perform. You see, comics go from club to club. And they, they don't care where they're performing. They'll perform in a gas station, you know what I mean? Which is not great for your resume, but it's good experience. If you can, on the weekends, if you can make $100 a show, and you do six shows that night, and some comics will do as many as eight shows. They, they, they run from club to club. In Manhattan, if there are 12 clubs, you have an opportunity to do several shows a night. So you can make six or $800 a night on the weekends. During the week, at $25 a show, it's as many shows as you can squeeze in. Comics run from club to club, which doesn't give them much of a life. If you're on the comedy scene, you'll see, as soon as they finish their set, they're packing up to run to the next club. Because if you're gonna pay your bills from doing comedy, you gotta Stay busy. You gotta work as many clubs as you can. Come on, be loud, be proud. We gotta get the energy up in this room. Why are you married people? <laughs> See, I like how the women always sneak a peek at the guy to make sure he's applauding. I saw you do that. I think when you like, first start out in comedy, you don't really deserve much money. It takes <laughs> a long time to get good at this. And right. most people, it takes them at least a decade. And by the time you get to that point, you can actually do the gigs where you get decent money. In the beginning, you can't. And, yeah. and I think it actually makes you work a little bit harder. Right. Because, you know, you have these things where you start out as an MC, and then you want to move up to a feature mm -hmm. act, and then eventually you want to move up to a headliner. So the, the bad money is a great motivator. My name is JJ Ramirez, better known as the Latin Lunatic. Working comic now since 1981, so it's 31 years. Come July, it'll be 32 years. I'm lucky that I'm single still, so uh, I get to go and not have to have. There's a lot of comics who travel, have families and kids, and they have to worry about stuff like that, but I, I'm able to travel and pretty much pick up and go when I want. On a Friday or Saturday, I do seven, eight, nine gigs. When I, I'll do four or five on a Wednesday and Thursday, so by between Wednesday and Saturday, I'm done usually when I'm in the city between 25 and 30 gigs in those four nights. Hello. 
My name is Sashir Zameda. I'm a comedian. I do improv and stand up and sketch. I don't know how to label myself. I guess I'm one of those like slash artists, like actress slash stand up slash improviser slash writer. Whichever gives me the most money is the one I am at the moment. All right, yep. sometimes I overreact. Thank you. And uh, I am a full time comedian. And I wasn't one until last year. Last year was the first year I was able to fully sustain myself from comedic ventures. I'm lucky enough that I, I do get paid sometimes to do stand-up. It's not enough for me to live off of it, but I like that I get paid. It's, it makes me feel like I'm a working comedian as opposed to just like doing shows for the fun of it. Although I still do shows for the fun of it because it's still fun to me. If the concept of getting paid every time I'm on stage wasn't a thing, I'd probably still be on stage all the time. I don't know if I would, uh, would complain about not getting money, because I just like performing, and I know that there's still a benefit in being seen by people and having them want to work with me, because that will lead to more money later. My icons are like Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, but I don't have too many that look like me. And I just wish there were more. <laughs> I wish I could see more people that look like me, even if they're not saying the things that, I'm, that I believe in. I wish there were more people like that. Is anybody here from France? No. Let's talk about them for one minute. My name is Modi, and I, um, I've been doing comedy 19 years now. I've headlined clubs all over, where you're picking up whatever money the club gives, and it's, you're there Thursday through Sunday. And then, now, I have a name in corporate events. There's not a disease I have not performed for already. Between juvenile diabetes, any type of cancer in the world, I've been there. They do the benefit, they put a movie on about some guy, I lost my ear, and then they, and now for some levity, here's Modi. And those pay money. Too soon? <laughs> Shecky Magazine is dedicated to the glorification of stand-up comedy. <laughs> and we started it in uh, April 1st, 1999. Everybody thought it was a joke, of course. It's always been free. It's always been online, never a hard copy. And it goes out to stand-up comics, stand-up comedy fans, people in the industry, anybody who wants to read it, people in the media. It wants to give people an insight into what it was like to be a stand-up comic. Right. Um, it's very inside, but it's very accessible. We try to walk a very fine line as far as appealing to people who, who know a lot about the business and people who don't know a lot about the business. Well, every once in a while at the magazine the phone would ring or we get an email from somebody in the media inquiring as to how many comics are there? And we would, we would scratch our heads for a while and we would crunch the numbers and try to estimate how many clubs there were and how many comics each club needed per weekend and blah blah blah. And we'd come up with a figure somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, 2,000, something like that. But the thing is, it's really a weird number because some people work regionally or locally. Some people work all across. We work all 50 states and, and Canada. Some people keep their day jobs. Some people range So they're not necessarily hobbyists, but right. they're almost like part-timers. Right. Uh, there's people who come in it just during their 20s and then they leave when they meet a girl and she says, you better start making money. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's people who stay in it for 40 years. There's people who drop out for a while and then come back into it. Some people get writing jobs for a while. Yeah, they supplement so the record with writing it's, jobs. it's really hard to keep track because you know there's there's this idea that once you're a comic always a comic and so I suppose we would count everybody mm -hmm. but it's hard to figure out how many comics are working at any particular time because people get siphoned off and people drop out and people come back. People always want to laugh and people will end up one way or another paying either the advertisers who are advertising on the show or paying for a concert people will pay their money to uh, be entertained by comedians so what's happening now is there's just a lot more roots to that and a lot more uh, different kind of business models with the web in there, with social media helping these comedians get a fan base, cable TV having a much more diverse array of programming with so much more comedy in late night than there used to be. What kind of moron is my mother that she doesn't know that Paul is a Beatle? I think it's really important as a comedian to find your voice and it takes years and years to figure out who you are on stage and a lot of young comics as was I are cocky about it and thinking oh, I know who I am you really don't you really find who you are on stage from years and years of work and being true to your voice and, and having your own voice and not taking no for an answer so many people told me I would never make it and you know give it up and I didn't anyway I'm Jeffrey Good you guys have been wonderful thank you so much
the fact that you can get paid for doing something like this is a wonderful thing. But whether you got paid or not, comics who love this, they do it for free. Not everyone will be a star, but just being out on stage and making people laugh is just an amazing feeling. I gotta go. <laughs> just want to tell you folks one more thing. If it wasn't for crowds like this, I'd be exactly where I am today. Thank you very much and good night. My name is Brian McKim. We, we finally concluded. This is what we do best right now. And this is what we're going to do. And it's what we're going to have to do. Not that we don't want to, but it's what we're going to have to do in order to make the bulk of our income. It's probably the best day I've ever had, actually. <laughs> There is so much for guys who are both performers and writers. There's so many more outlets. So I actually think the business of comedy, there, there's, there's a lot more opportunities probably than there were back then. There's a lot more avenues and you know, ways to make it in the business. I think it's marvelous. Why not uh, use every way you can, do everything you can. I'm all in favor of anyone trying to uh, have a career in show business. It's an escape from other kinds of real work and, and routine. The cliche that, you know, comedy is hard, and I believe there is truth to that. It, it, not everyone can, can be funny. Not everyone can deliver the line uh, the proper way and has a good sense of comedy. And I think that's a gift. I think that making people laugh is um, a, a very good business and, and, and a, a high calling, I think. You know who that is? A check it, Green. Did you ever see him on television? No. No. Oh. He was on uh, Shecky. What show were you on? Uh, Ed Sullivan. Did you ever see him on Ed Sullivan? No. It's a Shecky. I want to ask you, what are you going to do now? Because you really messed me up last time you were on our show. And I worked for a guy by the name of Harris who talked like this. This is way he talked. And he raised horses. And yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh. Hey, I want to tell you, Shecky's doing me, isn't he? I mean, Rickle's doing me. I, 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 I tell you the truth, he's doing me. No, this is, this is, this is fine now. And I want to say, hmm, uh, I think maybe I'll be on television now, be a crook. Oh, my goodness gracious. He certainly looks lovely. Close up all the places. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of the business, I'm out of show business. I watched, you know, different things on television and everything. And then, like, every once in a while, I put on a tape of mine. And I say to my wife, with a tear in my eye, my God, I, I, I wasn't bad. <laughs>